Welcome to the Workshop Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew. And today joining me is the uh, the OG guest himself, Mr. Keith Drennan. How are you doing today, Keith? I'm good. How are you? Well, not too bad. So you all relaxed from your uh, your relaxing holiday? I am. It's been a pretty good week so far. Your, your shui is all funged and all that or whatever. Your cheese are aligned. <laughs> My cheese are aligned. Yep, I'm quite zen these days. That's good. I've uh, I've been noticing here recently, listening to a few different podcasts that you're spending a lot of time uh, helping uh, Jeff at Green Street. There, you're you're practically becoming his second employee. Uh, yeah, kinda. One day a week, I'm over there helping him. So it's pretty Going good. To, going to become a uh, cabinet maker are you or <laughs> maybe maybe it's not it's not necessarily in the cards he doesn't have that much work but maybe it's fun it's nice i <laughs> a... i i'm learning a lot about what i don't know every day i'm over there which is interesting so yeah i imagine there's a lot of uh production stuff that that you haven't done before that you're kind of getting thrown into the deep end on eh? Yeah, but uh, I, I, I've been mainly helping them with installs, which is fun for me uh, because it's a huge learning curve. Like to install a whole kitchen from scratch and stuff is pretty It's pretty cool to see how that goes. Like obviously in the shop, the, I'm, I'm learning the in the shop stuff too, but it's always so random Be only being there one day a week that it is what yeah. it is. But like on the installs is like it's – it's interesting to see the process and then the way he does things and why, and it's cool. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. There's a lot of things with cabinets. I've I've done a few installs, not enough to be anywhere close to competent, but there's so many just like nuanced steps of what you should do first and what you should measure and what you should just stick in there or, or whatever to, to speed the process. Yeah. It's a, uh... It's interesting and it changes for every install, you know, but you know, when you're working with people who do it every day and have done it every day for years, it's just like, one, I feel like I get in the way when I, I help. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird thing, you know, yeah. but it's fun. I highly recommend well, it. If you ever have the opportunity to work with, with a crew like that, I, I highly recommend it. Yeah. If nothing else for the experience, because you, you, you can... It gives you an appreciation for for uh, other other skill sets. Yeah, yeah. But it's just like I don't know. It's all woodworking in the end, right? So, so you figure, oh, this is going to be a cakewalk. Then you get there day one, and you're like, this is nothing like working in your own shop, doing your own thing, right? <laughs> and and yep. then like the level of accuracy he works to. It's just like, this is like, I'm stressed the entire time I'm there. I mean, I'm having a good time. I'm learning a lot, but everything I'm like, man, I don't want to screw this up. I don't want to screw this. <laughs> so it's kind of like, uh, it's stressful, but it's fun. I like it. That's good. Yeah. He strikes me as the type of guy that that's like, if there's a, if there's a 16th gap somewhere, he's going to freak out about it and try to figure out how to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. He's very. He's very particular. He's very uh, precise, I guess is the word to put. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's good. Like he, he lays out what he expects. And as long as you hit what he expects, you're okay. So, so he hasn't fired you yet then is what you're saying? Uh, no, maybe we'll see. I don't know. He hasn't yelled at you too much. Uh, no, no. No, nothing that you're going to admit to. I'm just trying to think of a time. I mean, I, I, I've, I've definitely made mistakes over there, and he's, uh, he's a, he's a, he's a pretty good boss. You know, it's probably the best way to put it. He's a easygoing. He, I mean, as tough as he is on the work itself, he's pretty easygoing and everything else. But I'm just, well, uh, I'm just a helper. You know, I'm not an employee per se. So. I help yeah. him out when he needs help. And... That's the worst when you work for people who, who have like, you know, vastly more experience than you. And you're the, you're the, the helper. 
and then they expect you to do it as well as they do without any sort of guidance or any sort of uh, um, grace for for error. That gets really yeah. frustrating. Or it's the speed thing, right? Like he's done this action ten thousand times, right? And then I go in there and it's my day one and I'm not meeting that expectation of speed is kind of like, oh man. Like when I first started over there, he, he was working on those boxes that he makes. Like the little salt boxes he yeah, does with salt. that. Yeah. So so they make like five hundred at a clip or whatever the number is. I, I forget what this what what this latest round was. But I was in there and I was helping him do it and I I'm, it's just repetitive, right? constant repeat 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 and i feel like i'm going as fast as i could possibly go on whatever the task was at the time and uh and i get done i'm like so how'd i do he's like ah you know you probably should have finished them all today i was like what there's no way i could move faster (laughs) and he's like yeah probably you could have and i was like oh okay and then rob showed up uh he just popped in to say hi or whatever and he comes over and he's like it's not as easy. It's not as easy as we make it look, is it? I was like, no, it's not. And he's like watching me and he's like, yeah, yeah. Is this, is this your first day on this? I was like, yeah. He's like, yeah, I could tell. And it's just like, what? I was like, how many would you have gone through by now? And he's like, oh, I probably would have been done by now. How do you move faster? Like the machine only moves so fast, you know? I don't get it, but uh, apparently when I went back the next day, I was cruising a lot faster than that first day. But it's one of those things. What's that? No, go ahead. No, I want to hear what you were going to say. That actually speaks to skill learning a little bit because um, a lot of people, they get get trapped into into the, oh, just keep doing it until you master it. And you actually, that that's actually detrimental to your to your ability to learn a new task you you're better off like doing the thing and then taking a breast uh, a, a breast a rest <laughs> um better better off taking a bit of a rest and then allowing that to process in your head and to to kind of consolidate the neural pathways and then returning to the task yeah anyway that's what i was going to say yeah, no, that makes sense. But in this case, I was just, I was only sanding, right? So, like, how much skill am I picking up? But really what I I think it was in this case was, like, we were up against the deadline, right? So he only had so much time to do and only so much material. So if you screw one up, now that could set us back, like, a week, right? So it was more like... Yeah. Not so much the skill, the, the, help me out here. It's like the confidence in what you're doing. Like, oh, I could push this into the sander a little harder and get it done faster. But like, I didn't want to screw it up. And then when the comfort level gets there, then you start to speed up. But yeah. it was just one of those things. But, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's the other thing that that's about, uh, uh, I forget when I talked about it. It was a few, a few episodes ago, I talked about cerebellar automation. Um, so oh yeah, first... cerebellum automation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what your cerebellum is. <clears throat> so, you, so you got your brain right, and then at the at the base of your skull, you got that little like looks like a secondary brain underneath your brain. Yeah, if you can picture a picture an image. Yeah. Uh, so, so that little ball at the base of your brain that's your cerebellum, and that has that that controls a lot of your motor movements and stuff like that. And and it's also really involved in automating things that you do. So things that become habits and, and rituals or or uh, skills you don't think about, they're they're transferred from your cortex to so your higher thinking down into your cerebellar control. Okay. And so when you're when you're at that state of of like first learning a task, like oh, I don't want to go too far, you're using a lot of brain power to to control everything. But then once, once it switches over to that automated stage, you're more confident in yourself, but it's because, because your body has now automated the task. And so it automatically stops where you need it to be. And your movements are, are automated instead of, instead of up in your brain being thought about, if that makes sense. Okay. 
It does make a lot of sense. Kind what's of. the part? What's what's that? I said kind of makes sense. It's all clear as mud now. Well, no, that makes sense to me. That it is to why you can. Because there are tasks that you do that you just hardly thinking about, and you can do whatever on top of it, yeah. like thinking about, like listening to an audio book while you're working or something, just because it's the same repetitive task. So that makes yeah. sense. What's the part of so your brain? You... What? Mm, I'm going to go pick ahead. your brain. I'm going to pick your brain now since we're talking about parts of your brain. What's the difference in the part of your brain from your speech to where you're screaming obscenities? Well, it's two, <laughs> it's two separate parts of your brain, yeah? Um, That's why people have <clears throat> Tourette's. That's why uh, I'm, I'm... people who, who have strokes can't necessarily talk but when they start screaming obscenities it comes out clear you yeah um or or other weird things like uh shoot what's his name now i think i think it was like one of the beach boys uh but but i could be wrong so don't quote me on this but there's a there's a singer from that era like beach boys era and it might have been one of the beach boys he he can't he couldn't talk like he had no ability to talk but he could sing wasn't that jan and dean yeah yeah, yeah, that's who it was. Anyone who doesn't know Jan and Dean but heard them would think they were the Beach Boys. So. But but you see how, uh, see, I, I made a connection in my brain, but I couldn't, <laughs> for, couldn't remember. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm honestly not completely up on the whole Tourette's thing. Um, and, and I forget what the dysfunction is there. But uh, I know with the, with the whole hit your thumb, hit, hit your thumb and start shouting obscenities or, you know, something that spooks you. So you have your, you have your, your speech areas in your brain and they're, they're kind of close to your, to your amygdala, which is your fear, fight, flight response stuff. But, but when you get that spike in, in fear stuff or fight stuff, anger, pain, whatever it is, you get a you get a flush of hormones or neurotransmitters from your amygdala that kind of shuts down your frontal cortex so your your the part of your brain that that will inhibit you shouting and and swearing and so then your your uh your, your I don't have that part of my brain that inhi- inhibits me from swearing it's just not there <laughs> well if you walked into a kindergarten, you you probably wouldn't swear at all the kindergartners, yeah. would you? Yeah, I probably won't or swear just... on this podcast either. But you know, see, see, there you go. That's just uh, you. You do have <laughs> that in a different level than than maybe say yeah. I do. But yeah, but I had an o- uncle who had had a stroke, and he could hardly speak afterwards. I mean, he had he would do stuff, but like one day for any time but one day in particular he had me working on his tractor for him which i don't know why a guy of his age was changing tires on his tractor but he came and got me to to do it we were over there and apparently i was doing something that wasn't to his liking and when he got mad he would scream at like once he was mad and screaming obscenities it was all clear but at any other time you couldn't understand what he was trying to convey to you it was crazy and that's when I learned that it's a different part of your brain. Yeah, well, it's not necessarily a different part. It's a uh, sometimes it's like the pathways between the parts that are just that are that are interrupted. Okay. Um, but yeah, in, in that case, I I wouldn't be able to like I could probably spend a little bit of time and 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 recall it all. But off the top of my head, I wouldn't I couldn't tell you why that would be the case. Yeah. yeah, there are a bunch of different speech control and it, and it depends on what area is damaged, right? Like you can have, um, there's stuff like face blindness. Have you ever heard of face blindness? Yeah, this, uh, Brad Pitt has that. Oh, does he? I didn't know that. He claims to have it, but I think it's just well, the amount very... of people he meets, you know? Yeah, well, there's, there's, I mean, again, there's varying levels of that, but face blindness, people there are people who legitimately wouldn't be able to recognize their wife, for example, like just you, they have to, they have to identify their wife by the sound of the voice and, and by memorizing certain features about, about them, but not necessarily look at the person and see their face. But otherwise there's, otherwise their visual cortex is um, completely normal but then there's some sort of like disconnect somewhere for some people 
And I think it happens in different ways in different cases. Like the brain's so complex. There's very rarely a single path to, to X problem. Right. Right. Anyway. Yeah. Brain's interesting. One of the most interesting ones I've ever run across was a, um, they call him patient M. I think, I think it's patient M, but he, he had some sort of, uh, um, viral infection in his, in his brain. And, and it completely eliminated his ability to form new memories. And so he, he would like, if he, he could, he could carry on a conversation with you or, or with whoever he could carry on a conversation but the moment he lost focus or con or, or looked away or anything, it was just completely gone. And then, so, so you'd be like talking to you, look away, turn back and go, Oh, Hey, how are you? Who are you? Blah, blah, blah. Like start right over from the beginning again. It's going to be a rough way to go through life. Oh yeah. I can, I, I, I can't even imagine, but the, in part of the part of the case study that I was reading, it was showing extracts from his from his daily journal, and it was just page after page after page after page of I woke up and then crossed out. I just woke up, crossed out. I just woke up, crossed out. It's like super super sad. Yeah, it's like fifty first dates all over again. You know. Yeah, except worse. But the interesting thing about it, though, is he could still learn new skills. Like they, like they would, uh, they do like a drawing task with him, right? And and they'd go over this time and time and time again, and you could see the progression of his of his ability to do the thing. And 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 then they would ask him, "Well, have you ever done this before?" And oh no, I've never done this before. This is the first time I've ever seen this. And and then, well, why do you think you're so good at this? I don't know, just natural talent, I guess. But so they That's used crazy. him to kind of, yeah, differentiate the the different memory pathways and skill pathways and stuff. It was interesting to read about. I yeah. can't imagine. And this is what you're studying for your oh, new that's, degree. That stuff I used, I learned a long time ago. That was my neuroscience degree. That stuff. What I'm studying now is more the. Uh, more the how to apply the stuff that I've learned in the past. That's crazy. Make you feel make you feel better about yourself. For example, Keith, can you tell me why you're such an angry man? I don't think I'm an angry man. I think that's the misconception. Yeah, you've never come across as an angry man, but everybody seems to give you the uh, the hard time. Always seems to give you the gears about being the the no new my... friends angry Jersey guy. It's my resting bitch face. I think that's what it is. So I don't know. I mean, I get angry over everything. I'm just messing with you. Everybody always used to call me Eeyore when I was a kid. And uh, <laughs> they'd always say the same stupid thing. They, they'd be like... Um, and then they called you Eeyore. I, I have a couple of people I call Eeyore, but I'm sure it's for different reasons. But go ahead. No, no they, they don't... They'd always say that, you know, it takes more smile, more muscles to frown than it does to smile. And, you know, everybody always says that. And then finally I got fed up with it. And I was like, I was like eight, seven, eight years old. And I got mad at somebody for constantly saying that to me. And I was just like, it takes no muscles to just have a relaxed face. Yeah. It's like, I'm not frowning. I'm just relaxed. Leave me alone. Plus, I mean, if you are frowning, it's a workout. It's a better workout than smiling. So there's it's that true, actually. It's it's actually better for you physically to frown than it just to smile. That makes sense. My face has never hurt from frowning all day, but when you're smiling after a while, it begins to hurt. That's true. So you're working on anything exciting currently? I'm working on my maker swap item. Making a toolbox. Jewelry box. Whatever. Similar to the one you made last year or uh not really. No. This will have a open top, even though I'm against open top toolboxes, but this one will have the open top and then just two drawers. So I guess it's kind of similar, but no. Different enough that you don't feel bad about it? Different enough I don't feel bad about it, yeah. Are you uh, you hiding the maker, 
the the maker camp logo somewhere in it i will not be hiding i will not be hiding i thought about that like just making a maker camp sign and put my name on it like entered by and i was like nah just to troll everybody yeah it's not even worth the joke in my opinion um and i have nothing against that logo it's just uh I'll, br- I'll bring it up here because I, I I keep getting questions on it still to this day. It's just that so many people put in the Maker Camp logo as their item that it's just like, all right, we're done. No Maker Camp logos, right? Because if one third of the 200 entries every year is Maker Camp logos, then eventually everyone's going to have like 10 at home. So I figured just to just to shake it up, well eliminate maker camp logos yeah so. if that's that makes sense like if it's the whole item doesn't matter what you do it does get kind of repetitive and and boring yeah uh just maker camp logos that's all the item was was uh, whatever medium it was and then made into a maker camp logo was 37 last year not Ooh. something that somebody had made and, and like emblazoned the logo over it it was just like they made the logo out of whatever medium they chose. And yeah, I mean, I love the maker camp as much as everyone else, but I, I'm not going to plaster logos all over my house that I got from the swap. Like there's only so many times you need a logo, you know? And I had a number of people come up to me, up to me last year. And they're like, yeah, I've, I've done this th- uh, three years in a row and three years I've gotten a maker camp logo. And they're not like complaining about it. They're just like, Every year I go home with another maker. Like, what am I going to do with all these maker cab logos? And I was like, all right, well, I think we can fix that. That's an easy thing. I, I didn't think it would be hit with so much uh, animosity from everyone in the crowd. It's almost like my skill versus knowledge debate. Like, it's just, a, just think of something else. Like, you're, you're not at home all year making maker camp logos, right? You guys aren't yeah. Austin from the maker camp. Like, you make other stuff, just make the, whatever it is you make at home. Just make that again. Like it's not a big problem. I don't understand what the yeah. problem is with people. And yet I'm well, the angry guy. I don't know. Well, that's what, when you, when you first announced that, I was like, well, I mean, I mean, who, who is just making a maker camp logo, but sounds like there is a lot of people who are just doing that. Yeah. But, yeah. It's the low hanging fruit, you know, like, Oh, I work with wood and epoxy. Let me, epoxy a maker camp logo or i have a laser let me take a board of pretty wood and laser on a maker camp logo or like it's not even that they design the logo like it, it it's like it's like getting something off a of thingiverse and 3d printing it don't even get me started <laughs> but yeah it's like that and we had a couple of people do that and that's not i mean i'm gonna have to turn those down too like it should be something you made not a tool in your shop made it for you so you know but yeah so yeah i'm not against like if somebody makes something and they put the logo in the corner whatever right i get it like oh this is where they got it from but i don't know yeah but it should i agree with you though it really should stand on its own as a as a thing yeah yeah i don't see the need to put the maker camp logo on anything you know whether they got it from maker camp or not but i get some people like that so if they do it they do it but as a standalone maker camp logo not my thing are you the type of guy to turn your shirt inside out so you're not advertising for uh for brands no as i see your house made shirt on <laughs> yeah yeah no, I don't do that. And I'm not against the maker. Like, obviously, I'm a huge fan of the maker camp, right? We promote it all the time on the podcast. I'm promoting it on my page. I'm always telling people they need to go, even if they're not a maker, go to the maker camp. Like, I'm a huge proponent of the maker camp. I don't want to make a camp logo thing in the swap, you know? Yeah. Like, the, the idea of the swap is to make something with your skill set. Nobody's skill set is making the maker camp logo. You know what I mean? Except for the original guy who designed it. Correct. So yeah. that's my f- philosophy on rolling it out, but we're beating a dead horse. Yeah. Well, where where I was actually going to go with that, asking you that question is, 
is when you're when you're doing a project specifically for somebody you said the maker camp logo is a low hanging fruit but it's also it doesn't show any intention in it right whereas if you're if you're creating a creating a one off item whatever it is and you're uh designing it building it from your head or from your skill set it takes a lot more intentionality to direct your skills than it does to to take the take the image and and apply your skills to it if that makes sense so my question for you then in your in your line of work since you're since you're a an engineer type right yeah or en- en- engineer tech is that what you are technically or yeah you could call me an engineer for the purposes of this conversation sure okay you are a doctor of engineering <laughs> I did not say that. doctor of oh. engineering keith drennan Mm. As, uh, um, Esquire Esquire <laughs> Knight of the Realm Sir Keith Drennan Esquire PhD Doctorate of Engineering Correct uh, you, you, Your job is very linear Right? Like there's a lot of Step one, intention Step two, step three Step four um, Yeah And and you pursue You pursue that line As a part of your job Whereas your your creative side your shop side you tend to let it be more free flowing right kind of pursue your 100%. whims yeah yeah like for for me i do uh at work i'm making construction drawings every day right uh i go out to the site i figure out what's on the site i design the structure that's got to go there and then I draw it and I make construction drawings and I give it to the guys that build it. Right. And that's what happens. So everything in my shop, I never do a drawing for ever. I did a drawing for one thing so far, but other than that, I just go out in the shop and I just make it. You don't like napkin sketch anything even, or Uh, sometimes I'll do it. Yeah. But only, only because I want to get the proportions to the golden ratio. Correct. It's not like I, I I make myself a cut list. I don't I don't do any of that. It's all it's generally uh all right, I want it to be about this wide, so then it needs to be this tall, right? For the golden ratio. And then, then I roll with that. And then once I have those two basic construct measurements, everything else is relative on the inside. So whatever is gonna fit is just a relative dimension. I don't I don't think of math in that way. I don't do any math in the shop. I just go out there and do. It's my time. It's it's a zen place for me. So I just go out there and I don't want to have to do work when I'm in my shop, if that makes sense. Yeah, so then that that sets up the dichotomy of my next question for you then. Um, <clears throat> if you were given the option to pick one way of working or the other for everything... Which would you choose? That's a tough go because both have their merits, right? And I think for me, the linear faction of everything with, as you say, and I, I hate this word, everything with intention, right? In At work, like going in that one linear, everything's got to be done this way, this way, this way. I got to meet this code. It, this has to be done with that code and fit in those constraints and just going through the motions, having a plan of attack. There's merit to that because you can just cruise through things where on the free flow side, things may not work out the way you want. Like they, it could go awry. It could wind up being ugly. It could wind up not working, right? There's so many different aspects of that. But you're breaking a lot of rules too in the same in that same sense and you can lead yourself towards something different and cool and artistic so there's a benefit to both so which would i choose i think i'd go free form did you have the you have the soul of an artist is that why i don't know i don't know why i think i think with the other way everything can be broken down right so it's kind of like what we were talking about like when i'm working at green street i'm obviously working off of plans right that's not my shop that's his shop right so i have to follow his plans his thing and everything's got to be done. So everything can be measured and structured and 
a timetable can be put, a, a budget constraint, all that stuff has to be there, right? It's everything's chopped up. It's almost like it's all handed to you. Like you're not really a part of it, right? You're just going through the motions. You're the two hands that, that that made it happen. But in the other way, your hands are making it happen, if that makes sense, right? And I kind of yeah. like that way better. I don't know if that, that's the artist in me or not. I don't consider myself an artist by any stretch, but I guess that would be the way to go. Well, I think if you're if you're approaching intentionality or, or, or that linear project flow, the end result of that is Ikea, right? Because Not always. In most cases, I would say it is because you're, because the, the, the purpose of that is to, is to eliminate waste, which is not a bad thing. And it's to speed production or it's to uh, create uniformity in things. And I, and I'm, and to be clear, I'm not saying that Ikea is a terrible place or a bad thing. Um, but, but when you're in that, in that linear process of measuring everything to the nth degree and everything being uniform and that's the end result. Whereas, whereas the more free form you end up getting, I wonder if I can do this. And, and then that's where you, you get the development of epoxy river tables or, uh, um, do you know, uh, two, two people that I really, I admire, do you know, Seth Rowland at all? So, so he's a furniture maker. Um, he, he does some pretty out of the box, cool stuff. Like, I think he's the first person that I've ever seen do the, do like the rock as the base of the table and then have everything kind of carved around it and out or I've seen uh, that. yeah that's cool or uh who's another crowd i'm drawing a blank on his name australian um, dude um he lives in texas no um I'm still trying to look up seth roland is it roland i think so yeah you'll have to send it to me i can't find that who's the australian dude? Uh, I, no uh, yeah that's what's making me up, upset um starts with a p uh, Padula Morley. Oh yeah, no. I love that dude. Padula Studios. He's one of my favorites. Yeah, like some of the stuff that he comes up with. Like, like there's no way that you could start out with a a cut list, right? On that, right? But that's not IKEA either. Well, yeah, and that's what I mean. That's the other end of the spectrum, right? Is like, is is the one I feel leads towards IKEA. And the other one leads to one off, I would say, unable to or unreplicable. Uh, like, yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. But I think there's two schools of thought there because the IKEA model, like if you if if you were to take like IKEA just strips away all that's not necessary. Right. So it, yeah. it, what is that function over form? essentially right it's mass yeah. produced it's the cheapest produced all that stuff right and there's good to that right and then you go into padula and and you, you can't mass produce any of that stuff right no. his twists and turns and with the wood and all that the carvings that he does but there's a balance in between there right and the, 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 there's a ton of artists that like these big sculptural guys, like they'll come up with an idea that's completely a free formed idea in their head or whatever. And then they make the plans and give that to the guys who actually build it. Right. And they get zero credit for it. Right. But then it, it's, it's like those artists, like the guy who makes like the balloon animals, he doesn't actually make those balloon, like those big metal balloon animal type structures. What's his name? Well, I I know what you're talking about, but I have no idea who he is. Yeah, or the guy who designed the bean in Chicago. What I, what's it called? Cloud I don't know Lift or something. I don't know. But like he didn't actually build it. He just designed it and gave his plans to somebody and somebody else made that into realization. So they're even though it's a free form idea and, and pure art in a sense, somebody else did it. So both could be translated one with with the intention like this is what i need you to do and then there's a guy like padula just in the shop doing his own thing that's true another one actually that 
comes up with cool stuff now that I'm thinking about what you're from your perspective. Um, Paul Cox Edge, you seen him? No, that he, he does a lot of like, I would say he's an artist first and then furniture designer second. Mm. Like he'll get these like material things. I think, um, nope, that's not him. Chopper builder. Yeah, that's why I was asking. Found it. Yeah, artist designer based in London. You just got a fellow from me. Yeah, he does some really cool, interesting things. Um, and 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 what he does is he like he he made this table a little while ago. That's um, it's basically two sheets of no not that one oh. or no yeah no it is that one yeah you're that's right the that's one, one of them that's the one that made me stop it's it's one sheet he made and then he holds it up to a mirror yeah 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 it's like it's like one or one and a quarter inch thick steel plate steel that spent years over. Or, yeah he, he talks about it in in that post there and you know took him a year or two to get it manufactured but he doesn't do it but he looks at the material and goes oh i wonder how i can do this and then you know this is the shape i want and then gives it to the engineer to to figure out yeah but who actually made it though who's the guy with the skill (laughs) who's the guy with the skill we're getting into skill versus knowledge again does paul have the skill to pull it off or does he have the knowledge to design it i think that's very clearly a knowledge situation or the skill, skill to design in... it but not the skill to produce it so yeah. it's always a question start a start a fight <laughs> that's what, one that's thing what i can it's what i do best Hatch. <laughs> <laughs> that's but yeah one thing one thing we'll definitely have to have to agree on is that 3d printing requires no skill right that's... yeah i mean we don't have to agree but that's my stance and i'm sticking to it yeah Actually, that's that's something that's getting frustrating for me is the 3D printer that I have. Or that we it's have. Time it's to just sell like, that thing. Put it up on eBay. Get yourself. It's not a worth selling though. That's the thing. Like I think I paid 190 bucks for it when I bought it. But yeah, that's rough. Just buy a bamboo. You know, with all that extra money you have while you're building in the house, just buy a bamboo. <laughs> yeah. That's, well, d- truth be told, actually, there is. I have a. Uh, I have an axe hanger on my uh on my etsy store and this is just a 3d printed kind of a minimalist one it hangs behind the axe head you can't see it except for two little pins that come up and i sell one of those every not quite every week but they come in frequently enough that it's worth leaving there but i would be able like i fight with that i should buy a bamboo or a better printer just to produce those. But then I have this paranoia that if I do buy one, then the sales will stop coming. And then I will have not justified the purchase of the printer. That's called Murphy's law. And that's exactly what would happen. I, yeah, I know. But it's, but the, the one I have now is starting to get to the point where I just, I cannot calibrate it well enough to keep it printing correctly. And so every one that I print, I end up printing another one just to... You know what you do is you find somebody with a bamboo and you say, make me 10 of these. That's an idea. And then you have 10. And then or, when you have or eight I left... Sub out, or when you I sell sub eight... Out the, uh, production, sub out the production and shipping to somebody who has a bamboo and just take yeah. my dollar or whatever profit. Right. I would but... ask you, but you don't ship things, so... <laughs> I didn't offer. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I would, you know, if you had somebody here and an order came in, you couldn't get it printed, I'd print it for you. But I assume you're Etsy's Canada, so for me to ship to Canada would be a nightmare. No, it's North America. Most of my stuff goes to the U.S., actually. Yeah. But, no, the other the other thing is, is like, I can't get, because I can't calibrate it well enough, nothing I print is dimensionally accurate. And so if it's a, if it's a one-off piece, it's fine because it's just a one piece thing. And, and if it's a half a millimeter different in dimension than I designed it, it doesn't really make much of a difference. 
but then there's all sorts of stuff that I want to print that that if I print it in two halves or in two parts, it won't work because I can't get it to to connect, right? That's and that's extremely frustrating. It is. It kind of like negates the purpose of having the stupid thing. Yeah. Yeah. Then anyway, again, it, not, it, at least it's not your skill set. So it's true. I can always blame the machine. Always blame the machine. Yeah. What do they say? Uh, a good it, craftsman blames his ne- tools. Isn't that the never same? Never blames his tools. Yeah. Unless you're in Canada, then a good craftsman blames his tools. <laughs> yep. Anyway, so. That was, uh, so why do you not like the word intentionality going, circling back there? I, I, I don't like, uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I find when people are like, oh, you have to do stuff with intention and, uh, and, uh, um, it's when people say that phrase, oh, you have to do stuff with intention or, or I do things with intention. I, I, I find it, uh, What's the word? Uh, pretentious? Like, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It's just one of those things that irks you. Yeah. Just to say, oh, oh yeah, you have to do it with intention. Like, I make with intention. Like, I get those intentional things we it. all do. It's just the way it's portrayed when people say it like that is kind of like, and I get in the context of our conversation tonight, it makes sense. That's not it, but yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. There's a lot of like the the self-help gurus, that type of people that, that they use the word intention. You have to be intentional with your actions and they kind of misuse misuse it and abuse yeah. it. Yeah. Have you ever gone to an art show? Yes. You ever talk to a bunch of artists? I try to avoid it when possible. There's something about like the way I swear it's taught in art school. Because if you ever meet uh, like a like an artist that's just an artist, didn't go to school for it or whatever, they just talk about their art like, hey, yeah, this is what I think is cool, man, you know, whatever. And then you yeah. meet somebody who went to school for it and they use words like, uh, I don't know, intention and it, like – you need to paint with intention or whatever. It's like, it's like, it's like they go through a checklist of different things they say to sell their art. Right. And I feel like anyone who is going through that checklist, I can, uh, I will automatically write off as like a, a, a true artist in my mind. You're just a person who wants to sell your art. You wouldn't do it unless there was a potential to have money made later on. It takes me out of the whole, oh, this is cool type thing, right? It takes me out when I start hearing people using all those key phrases that you hear at any art show, whether it be painting, sculpture, whatever type of art show it is, and they're talking that way. It's just like, all right, I'm I'm not going to listen to you anymore, right? And that's one of those phrases, like to do something with it, like if they're talking about, oh, I only do things with intention and all that stuff is like. I I understand where you're coming from because my wife has a, she has a bachelor's in music in in flute performance, right? That's her first degree. And, and you see the same thing with musicians. Like there's, there's people who like to play. There's people who like to play music. And then there's people who are musicians and then there's people who are musicians. That's kind of what you're. Yeah. 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 And I'm not saying everyone who goes to school for art is that that way. But, you know, the people I'm talking about who went to school for art and then they try and sell it with every key phrase. It's just like, all right. One, you're either just out of school, just at art class or two, you don't really like art. You just want to sell it. You know what I mean? And that's where. It's or, a pretentious or, or thing art, for me. Art gives you a superiority complex. Th- those are the annoying people. It's not always a complex. They feel like they're superior because they're an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Th- I don't know if that would be a superiority complex or not. You would know that. I-, I would call it a superiority complex, yes. Yeah, all right. Because, because most of them aren't. They're yeah. just annoying. But maybe yeah. that's just my inferiority complex speaking, so I could be wrong. Same with me, so I don't know. 
but yeah that's all right well we've been chatting for a bit here you probably want to go to bed so you can wake up and do it all again in the morning i'm going back in the shop you are you not working tomorrow or are you just uh i'm not working and work until two o'clock in the morning no i'm not working tomorrow so it's part insomnia part uh i get the day off i work better at night so that's the eternal conflict in our marriage actually is my I, i'm a night person and my wife's a morning person and so it's like i would I rather work one. until two o'clock in the morning than wake up at four i know you want to end this you probably got to get back to your family and stuff but what is it with morning people that think they're better than everybody else you ever notice i don't that? know yeah yep. like you you slept until nine o'clock what is wrong with you I'm like, well, yeah, because I was up till 4 a.m. being productive. <laughs> well, I got up this morning and I was productive. What's the matter with you? You know, like, I don't get that either. Just, yeah, it, it, I, I think it's because we spent, we, we've spent so much time getting the, uh, the message that the early bird gets the worm drilled into our heads that we forget that the second rat gets the cheese. Right. Right. No. Yeah. That's a actually owls eat it on that. too, though. You know. Sorry, what I. I just said the early bird gets the worm, but owls eat at night. So there's yeah. gets the sleeping early bird. But I actually, I actually just read a study, kind of leading on on with that mental health and physical health and well being type of thing and sleep. Because we all, everybody knows that you need the optimum sleep right and right. uh research says that that going to bed earlier is actually better for you your health and there's, there's a fairly large body of research that says that however a recent meta analysis so so a meta analysis you take a whole bunch of a whole bunch of existing research and you reanalyze the data and and recrunch all the numbers in light of everybody else's study and you come out with another answer right and so in a recent meta analysis of all of this data uh they discovered that as long as you go to bed before one o'clock in the morning you're probably good so so going to bed early is any time before 1 a.m yeah that's pretty good but that's on what metric though this is the look, just, like are they trying to are they trying to shoehorn everyone into a nine to five position? So going to bed before one a.m. or is it in any twenty four hour period? Do you have to go to bed earlier than you did yesterday? Because that would be the only way to make it earlier. Time is just time, right? It doesn't matter what what time it is, right? So if I get eight hours and I go to bed every day at three, let's just say, right? I'm gonna play devil's advocate. If I go to bed every night at 3 a.m., right? But I get a full eight yeah. hours. Then I wake up and I do whatever I do for my day. And I go to bed the next day at 3 a.m. How is that any different than somebody who's going to bed at 7 o'clock at night getting eight hours and waking up early in the morning? Like, yeah. it doesn't, it, just because of daylight, is that it? Is it daylight that's changing people's mental health? Um, that, that is part of it actually, but, um, that's the thing about, the thing about a meta analysis is that, that your most studies, they have a limited number of people, right. In order to get to a, a yeah. statistical then significance. They extrapolate it out. Yeah. Yeah. But a meta analysis. So, so let's say you have a hundred studies that have a hundred people in them. Each study, you know, their significant number is a hundred people but then you combine that to a thousand people, I guess that would be 10,000, wouldn't it? Um, the, the statistical prediction power of that is much, much higher. And it also, it also erases a lot of the other variables because you have a much, much more varied population. And so that's where with the, with the whole 1 a.m., deadline there probably is still a little bit of bias in that research towards a certain point of view because that's impossible to avoid but because it's such a a larger study it take it, it will incorporate people who do shift work who do wake up 
late and go to bed early and and all all of these different variations and so they've come up with this 1 a.m number as just kind of a general rule number right like like smoking not everybody who smokes is going to die of lung cancer but everybody who smokes has a higher risk of dying from lung cancer right right so if you're the if you're the statistical anomaly of yeah you can go to bed at three o'clock in the morning and and get your eight hours of sleep and you're fine but maybe keith mark ii who does exactly the same thing there's something about his genetic makeup that that makes him susceptible to high blood pressure or whatever because of the sleep patterns right yeah. but we'll never know but the important I, thing I, is I... <laughs> the important thing is is to uh just live with intention in your life live with intentionality <laughs> regardless of whatever you do yeah yeah i was gonna say the important thing is the morning people are not superior to night people <laughs> no they're not no, it's the, it's the morning people that wake up really early that get hit on the road because the, you know, they're out exercising too early in the morning or whatever. Yeah, I just think whenever you're productive is when you should be productive, right? So for night yeah. owls, you should be productive at night like myself. And if you're a morning person, be productive in the morning. That's it. Yeah. Well, and that's... <clears throat> That's more to kind of conclude the whole intentionality thing. Um, the whole be intentional with your schedule is 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 not so much the pretentious, you know, yeah, I'm painting with intention, sort <laughs> of know. sort of aspect. But but it is it is being cognizant of what you're doing. Like like yourself, you if you if you're more productive at night then be intentional with when you focus your time to be productive, right? Or if you're more creative at right after you've eaten lunch, then then focus your your time in such a way that that's the time when you do your creative tasks. And, you know, focus your repetitive tasks for a for a different whatever, you know, that's more what intentionality really should be is is being intentional with your time is, is using your time in the way that makes the most sense for you rather than, you know, my job requires me to be at work at nine and, and punch the red button until five or whatever it happens to be. Right. right. Not that that's not that that's a hundred percent avoidable or anything, but there's also, there's also ways of, of optimizing versus just living. That's it. So there you go. Yeah. We'll just end it there. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for we'll, having we'll, me. We'll, uh, we'll have to, uh, conclude the conversation. This is, this is what they call a, uh, a hook. <laughs> um, we will conclude the conversation and give the ultimate secret to success. And, um, happiness in the post show because Keith is the most successful and happy person that I am currently talking to. Probably. Yeah. I, I would say that's accurate. Yes. Yeah. So I'll give all my secrets in the after show. Sign up for Patreon. Find out. Yeah. There we go. Thanks for coming on. Always a pleasure. So if you found anything from this episode to be helpful and you want to reinforce it for yourself, I'd like to invite you to share it with a friend in the next 24 hours. That'll help reinforce it in your mind and it'll help those around you, which is always a good thing. So thanks again for listening. And now I'd like to say thank you to all the amazing patrons of the Workshop Therapy Podcast. You guys make the show possible. If you're finding the show helpful and you want to support it, there are a few tiers, including a simple $1 a month option to just say thanks. For $5 a month, you can get access to the patrons-only feed that has a pre-show and a post-show, in addition to the regular podcast all-in-one feed. You, you all know that the good stuff happens after the official mics are off, right? If you can't support financially, I totally understand. But I'd love it if you left a five-star review or told a friend about the podcast. If you have any questions or feedback, I'd love to hear that as well. Send it to questions at workshoptherapypodcast.com and I'll get it on the show. I want to say thank you to all the patrons of the Workshop Therapy Podcast, but 
especially to the founding fathers, and they are Mr. Matthew Serio from Argiano Serio, Mr. Brad Harrison of Brad's Customs, Mr. Keith Drennan of Blackthorn Concepts, Mr. Eric Peterson of Overall Maker Works, Mr. Brandon Millichamp of Tectonic Creations, and the one and only the Grant Alexander. So a special thank you to the Founding Fathers and thank you to everybody who supports and shares the Workshop Therapy Podcast.